if you were to eliminate the call to the run method right here and run this program you would see a world with a white background and a single turtle positioned in the center of the world facing north. There would actually be two turtles there in the center of the world however they would be in exactly the same location with the same heading so that only the one closest to you would be visible. The code that you now see on the right is the constructor for the class named prob01runner. The primary purpose for which constructors exist is to assist in the initialization of the variables belonging to the object being constructed. However, it is also possible to directly initialize the variables as we saw earlier in listing 2. Here is a variable that was declared and initialized with the same statement. When a new object comes into existence, the variables belonging belonging to that object will have been initialized by any direct initializers such as the ones shown in this listing as well as any initialization code written into the constructor. However, the any code written into the constructor has the last say. Other than the variables the local variables inside of methods and constructors. If a variable belonging to a class is declared but not purposely initialized, it will automatically receive a default initialization value. The default values are 0 for the numeric types, false for the boolean type, and null for all of the reference types. Although it is not a good idea to do so normally, there is nothing to prevent you from writing code into the constructor that has nothing to do with variable initialization. For example, I often use this approach to require the students to display their name when an object in one of their programs is instantiated. That allows me to tie that code directly to that particular student and to avoid getting programs mixed up between students. If you write code in the constructor, that code is executed while the object is being instantiated. That is the reason that my name appeared before the other three lines of text in the output on the command line in the earlier figure that I showed you. As you can see from the constructor code on the right, the only code in this particular constructor is a single statement that causes my name to be displayed on the command line screen. The code in that constructor on the right causes my name to be displayed on the command line screen when the object is instantiated. That's the reason that my name appears ahead of the other lines of output text in the command line output that you see on the right hand side of your screen. My name is displayed when the object is instantiated. The remaining three lines of text are not displayed until later uh, after the run method belonging to the object returns. The last three statements in the code in the upper half of the right hand side of your screen calls the three accessor methods named 
get Mars, get Joe, and get Sue. The code at the bottom on the right hand side of your screen shows the definitions of those three methods. In this case they are very simple. Each method simply returns a reference to a uh, particular object. The first two references returned are references to, to two turtle objects and the third reference that's returned is a reference to the world object. Good object oriented programming practice says that most of the instance variables encapsulated in an object should be declared private. In addition, the class should make public accessor methods available for users, programming users, to gain access to the values stored in those private instance variables. Access methods, me methods of this type are often referred to as getter methods and setter methods because they frequently begin with the word get or the word set. If code outside the object needs to store information in the object's private instance variables, this should be accomplished by writing public setter methods. The author can write code in the setter methods to filter the incoming data to make certain that the state of the object doesn't become corrupt as a result of outside influences storing invalid data in the object. Everything in Java is passed and returned by value. It is not passed and it is not returned by reference. Each of the accessor methods that you see in the code on the bottom right hand side of your screen returns a copy of the reference to either a turtle object or a world object. For those of you who are familiar with C++, you need to know that returning a copy of a reference is not exactly the same thing as returning a reference in C++. The last three statements in the code on the upper right hand side of your screen causes those copies of the references to the objects to be passed to the print line method. This is what causes information about those objects to be displayed on the command line screen as you saw in an earlier figure. A very important concept in object oriented programming in Java is a method named toString. The toString method is defined in the class named object and inherited into every class that is ever defined because the class named object is the superclass of every class that exists in Java. Although it isn't obvious in this code here on the right hand side of your screen, when an object's reference is passed to the print line method, the code in the print line method calls the method named toString on that incoming reference and displays the string value that is returned by that toString method. This leads to a very important object oriented programming concept known as runtime polymorphism. I explain runtime polymorphism in great detail on my website. You should be able to find that material by going to Google and searching for the following text. There are two terms used in object-oriented programming. 
that sound a lot alike. Those terms are overloaded and overridden. Even though they sound a lot alike, they have absolutely and totally different meanings. The two-string method is overridden in the world and turtle classes to cause specific a specific text string to be returned whenever the two string method is called on a reference to an object of one of those classes that specific code is different from the code that uh, or that that behavior the the behavior of the overridden version is different from the behavior of the inherited default version and the string produced is also different the code indicated by the highlight on the right hand side of your screen shows the text string that is returned by the overridden version of the two-string method as defined in the world class. The text that you see in the last two lines here is the text that is returned by the overridden version of the two-string method in the turtle class. Now let's turn our attention to the beginning of the run method, which is shown in the code on the right hand side of your screen. Recall that the code in the main method shown on the bottom portion of the right hand side of your screen calls the method named run on the object of type prob01runner immediately after that object is instantiated. I told you earlier that if you were to eliminate the call to the run method you would see a turtle at the center of the world with a white background. The background of a world object consists of an object of Ericsson's class named picture. A picture object is encapsulated in the world object. By default that picture object that is encapsulated in the world object is all white and is exactly the right size and shape to completely fill the area inside of the world's border. You can see the world's border in the image on the right hand side of your screen. <laughs>